Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome to our time of worship today. Uh, we gather together today as God's family uh, to worship God, to give thanks for all that he is and all that he does for us. Uh, this morning, I, I just want to recognise that we come into this day perhaps having had all sorts of different kinds of weeks. Um, perhaps it's been a pretty indifferent week. Maybe it's been a, a good week. It's been a blessed week. Uh, or maybe it's been really toughy uh, this week. Uh, I want to encourage you, whatever your week has looked like, past seven days or so, um, however much or little you might feel like worshipping God today, uh, understand that God is here, God is with us, uh, God knows and God understands uh, whatever our week has looked like. This morning we, we begin our time and I want us just to focus on Isaiah 40 and verses 27 to 31. Isaiah 40, 27 to 31. The words will be up on the screen for us. The prophet Isaiah says this, Jacob, why do you say, and Israel, why do you assert, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my claim is ignored by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth. He never, he never becomes faint or weary. There is no limit to his understanding. He gives strength to the faint, and strengthens the powerless. Youths may become faint and weary, and young men stumble and fall, but those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not faint. So as we begin our time of worship today, I want you to think about what we're doing this morning, really as an opportunity to reflect this passage, as an opportunity to trust God. Uh, you might even want to, to do that as we begin and just simply say a, a prayer to God. God, I trust you in this moment. I trust that you're going to lead my heart and lead my life as I worship you and as I go into the rest of this week. In Isaiah 40, we see a promise for those who do that, for those who trust in the Lord. They will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not faint. Amen. So let these words be your medicine this morning as we begin this time of worship. My prayer is that we would enter this time today empowered, strengthened, equipped, because we've made that decision in our lives to trust God, to put him first, to honour him and to glorify him with all that we are. May God bless us. May God be with us as we turn to him. Let's pray together. Father, we, we thank you that, that you are the God who, who is always faithful, who is always constant, you never leave us nor forsake us. And we love you, Lord. We thank you that we can respond, not because of anything that we have done, but because of all that you have done for us. We thank you that the greatest evidence of your faithfulness is through your son and his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead. We pray, Lord, that as we now respond and worship to you, that we would just say that simple prayer, Lord, I trust you. And as we, we declare that with our heart, we would sing with all that we are, and we will recognize your goodness and your grace towards us. Bless us and all that we have planned for this time. Guide us, Lord. May your name be lifted high. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. Good stand. I 
stumble, even when I fall, even when I turn back, still your love is sure. You will not abandon, you will not forsake, you will cheer me on with never ending praise. Sing with joy now, our God is for us, the Father's love is a strong your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Neither height nor death can separate us. Hell and death will not defeat us. He who gave his son to free us holds music. Neither height nor death can separate us. Hell and death will not defeat us. He who gave his son to free us holds us in his love. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice. Now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Jesus for our sake you die. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, we in one. God of glory, majesty. the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. And the morning stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death, and the dead will 
their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored and the church of Christ was born then the Spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not yield, shall not wait by his blood and in his name in his freedom I am free for the love of Jesus Christ who has resurrected me we praise the Father praise the Son praise the Psalm 42, verses 1 to 2, which reads, As a deer longs for flowing streams, so I long for you, God. I thirst for God, the loving God. When can I come and appear before God? When we as followers of Christ are walking through difficult times, are we longing for Him? Are we seeking after Him? Are we thirsty and desperate to walk with Him, to be in His presence? He is our strength and our shield, and the only one who can truly satisfy that desire and longing in our hearts. Uh, let's continue to lift Him up by singing, As a deer. As the deer pines for the water, so my soul long after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. You Spirit, you, you alone. 
my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire and thy law to worship thee. Amazing love. Thou welcomes me, the kindness of mercy. Thou bought with blood, wholeheartedly, my soul undeserving. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. Amazing love that welcomes me, the kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly, my soul undeserving. God, you're so good. God. God who 
us more than our suffering, who gives us hope and a future that we can live in complete freedom because of all that you have done. In your name, amen. Good morning. Okay, and welcome to you all. Uh, it's now a time of intercessory prayer and um, pointing out look, uh, what, what's going on in the week ahead. So I've got like, four items that I thought we could pray for our prayer times, our missional communities, the, the football in Esau, and the lease that uh, from the council that will allow the, the summer camps to go on. Um, but before we go into prayer, I'd like us to read from. The New Testament, Luke 18, and it's verses 1 to 8. Thank you. Up. Yeah, there we go. Can we all see it? Um, now, he told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not give up. There was a judge in a certain town who didn't fear God or respect people. And a widow in that town kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while, he was unwilling, but later he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or respect people, yet because this widow keeps pestering me, I will give her justice so that she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. Then the Lord said, listen to what the, unjudge, the unjust judge says. Will not God grant justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay helping them? I tell you that he will swiftly grant them justice. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? I've always been struck with this passage that the judge is just the antithesis, the opposite of what our Lord is, that um, his, his, um, his encouragement, his command is keep praying, you know, hold the faith, keep reading on, and it's just uh, meant a lot to me. So as we come, well, let's prepare our hearts now as we come into the God's presence in prayer, as we seek him, let's all pray. God, <clears throat> we come to you this day, we come to you, Father, having, Lord, different personalities, we've had different weeks, we've had different situations in our lives, and yet you're the God who knows them all. We thank you and praise you that, Lord, you see into our hearts and minds that you command the worship, the praise, just like the, 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 the animal mentioned in the psalm, Lord, we, we crave after you, our hearts are, Lord, so desirous of, of you. And we come and we praise you, thanks, that your encouragement is that as individuals and corporately as a church that we continue to pray, we continue to pray. We ask, we seek, we knock. We keep on asking, we keep on seeking, and we keep on knocking. And that when we have these answers to prayers, Lord, we, are, we will not be slow to give you thanks and praise. And we come before you, Father God, and we know the, how important it is the emphasis on prayer for this church, Lord, and we pray for our prayer times throughout the week from the Monday through to, to Sunday, the different times, Lord, that we have. We just pray that as a church, Lord, when it's convenient, we will make the time to come before you corporately to pray for our different requests, Lord, to, Lord, that you truly would move and work in our ways. Father, we, we thank you for <coughs> things like the, the football and the, the ESO uh, groups that go on. And Lord, we know and we come before you and we thank you that you're, a, you're so interested, you're so concerned for all aspects of, of the church's life. And we just pray for your protection, we pray for enjoyment, Lord, for the lads that play on a Monday night, Lord, that they would truly kick the ball for the glory of God, that they would have that <coughs> Eric Liddell mentality, that whatever we do, Lord, we, he ran for your pleasure, as it said in the film, Lord, that these lads will play the, that, that beautiful game for your glory. Lord, and for um, Esau and the missional communities, Lord, that your command is that we, Lord, you want us to meet together as a church and 
to an extent that you know, encourage us not to uh, not, not to stop meeting so that we can build one another up in the faith we can encourage one another and we commit Lord um, Esau and the missional communities that your, your name would be truly honoured that we would truly come before you giving you gratitude and thanks um, for you and Lord we have a, a special request and a special plea to you that the the council, Lord, with the, the, the lease for the, the summer camps, Lord, for the holiday cup, uh, the holiday camp, and the ESO uh, camp too, Lord. Whoever is in charge, whether it's an individual or a committee, we pray that you truly would look upon our request, Lord, for the school let to open up, Lord, for us for Denison. That again, Lord, that you would use it for your glory, Lord. There's people, um, councils, I know that <coughs> they're notorious for the of slowness and of making decisions and yet the, the, the time is marching on we pray that soon uh, this week Lord that the Mark and the leadership in the church will hear Lord of a, a, a good offer Lord for the use of the, the school for the holiday club and so so we thank you we give you praise we give you thanks Lord that we can come to you and we lift our expecting hearts up to you knowing Lord that you hear our prayers and for answered prayer and faith Lord we just give you praise and thanks to the glory of God the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, and for his sake. All good? What's that? It's on. It's a good start, guys. All good, yeah? Uh, how's you doing? Okay. Uh, this morning we uh, continue on in our series in James. Uh, so last week we camped out on uh, verse 1 for a good bit of time. And we thought about what it means to have a servant faith. A servant faith. Uh, James's letter begins with this recognition that his whole identity is around this idea of being a servant of Jesus. Uh, and I hope we've been challenged and encouraged by that as we think about what it means to follow Christ. First and foremost, we need to carry that identity as well, that we are servants of Jesus. Uh, and this morning, we're going to be looking at the next few verses. So James chapter 1 and verses 2 to 4. And today we're going to ask a question. Uh, what does it look like for you and I to have a suffering faith? A suffering faith, so a nice easy subject for us today. Uh, let's look at this passage in James together. James's next words, following on from verse 1. I'm reading from the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible. The words are going to be up on the screen as well. So James says this, starting in verse 2. Uh, Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Amen. Let's pray. So, Father, we, we recognize that, that your word is alive today, and your word can make a difference to our lives. But we also recognize that your word is sometimes difficult. And we pray, Lord, that as we look at this passage, that you would speak. Help us to let go of ourselves, and help us to hear your still small voice as we apply and understand what this passage says. May you be glorified through our time. Would you anoint my words? Would you also anoint everyone here, Lord, as they hear that you would speak to them very clearly through your word? We pray that you would guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, suffering, difficulty, hardship, pain, anguish, confusion, depression, misery, sickness, these are all things that we experience and these are all things that we go through at some point and at several points within our lives and the reality is whilst it's common for all of us in a number of different situations and contexts, none of us really want to talk about it. Um, our suffering is a very personal thing and that's especially true in our context here in Scotland. 
and we find it difficult to open up and share what's going on. And it's very easy for us to put up this wall of pretense and to, to say that everything's fine, everything's okay. But deep down we know, in reality, we're struggling, we're finding it hard, we're finding it tough. Let's just think about our city uh, for a moment. Is it not the case that we see brokenness all around us? And I say that recognising that we're part of that brokenness. It's not just that we look out to Glasgow and beyond Glasgow and see brokenness. We contribute to the brokenness as well. Uh, we see brokenness in the home. How many families are no longer families? Uh, conflict reigns. And what it is that God has designed for humanity can so often fall apart. So we see brokenness in the home. We see brokenness in relationships. How often do we see friendships break away? Misunderstandings flourish. Division becomes more and more apparent. Relationships can often be ruined. We see brokenness in what people pursue and live for and ultimately worship. Our society here in Glasgow, in Greater Glasgow, is obsessed with comfort, consumed with being safe, brainwashed by entertainment, <coughs> constantly prioritizing our image, how we appear before other people. Just to give us a heads up, again, we aren't innocent of any of that either. Uh, we can so easily get caught up in that too. Uh, as the world walks in a certain direction, we so often follow in that direction as well, let's be honest. A lot of the time, we would rather pursue comfort rather than the comforter. Our lives can revolve around the things that our non-believing neighbours' lives revolve around. Often, we're not that much different from anyone else, apart from what we do on a Sunday. We also see brokenness in people's health, in people's health, people's emotional health, people's mental health, and most importantly, people's spiritual health. Uh, I had this moment a few weeks ago. I was uh, walking to the church from the other side of Duke Street. I was just across the road from the Duke pub. I was at the lights, and as I was waiting at the lights, to the right of me was a guy who was voluntarily trying to, to trim a large bush of its leaves using a metal spoon. You heard me correctly. Uh, some of you know who this guy is. Pray for that guy. Uh, to the left of me, walking towards me, was a bald man with a beard wearing a dress. Now, I don't, I don't judge either of these people. I'm just describing what I saw. And in all honesty, it broke my heart with what I saw. In the space of a few seconds, when I saw this guy to my right and this guy to my left, I was deeply struck by the brokenness, the lostness of our community. Our community really is lost. It's lost emotionally. It's lost relationally. It's lost spiritually. It really does need Jesus. Sin, brokenness, suffering is everywhere. This is a, the, pandem the pandemic that we have. And what's so sad about our society's response and even at times our response within the church is that we have a thousand different worldly ways to respond to this problem of brokenness. And the brutal reality is that none of it works. We continue to be broken. We continue to suffer. We continue to experience this tsunami of hopelessness. None of what we go through makes any sense. All of what we go through seems to be a complete waste of our valued time. And our response to this problem of sin and suffering is different variations of the response of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3 and verse 7. We read these words. Uh, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So human effort by itself is going to do absolutely nothing to aid us in the midst of the brokenness and the suffering of our lives. You only have to look at the mental health pandemic that we currently have amongst people of all ages, all backgrounds, all circumstances. What is society's solution but a whole variety of different fig leaf coverings in an attempt to help and resolve the various struggles that we go through and experience. So it might feel like we're, we're hitting a dead end this morning. There's only one way forward for us. As we come to this recognition, but our society is broken and all the things we try and do to fix it aren't really working. The only solution we have to our sin, our brokenness, our suffering is Jesus. Yeah, I think of the words of the Apostle Paul and these are words that we look at a lot within the life of this church and for good reason. 
2 Corinthians 5, 21, Paul says this, he made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Jesus really does take this problem of sin in our lives. He really does grant us freedom to now live for him. He really does open the door for us to experience restoration and healing, no longer under the power of sin, but instead we're under the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's good news. That's our starting point. If we want to experience freedom in the midst of all that we face in our lives and the brokenness and suffering that we come, that we come across day to day, we need to start with the gospel and the reality of all that Christ has done for us. And as we think about a solution to this brokenness, take a moment to reflect on these words of Jesus in John 16 and in verse 33. So Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5. Jesus says in John 16, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. So quite incredibly, our suffering is in fact part of God's plan for our lives. And it's part of his plan in that he walks with us, in that he walks, he walks us through the trial and the hardship and difficulty, the difficulty that we face. And it's through our suffering that we actually get to experience God more deeply in a way that we would not experience him if everything was going well, if we experienced blessing after blessing. So it's why he says in Luke 14 and verse 27, and again, it'll be up on the screen for us, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So to be a disciple of Jesus Christ is to die to your old life, to walk in the newness of life that God has for you. And as we walk into this life, we'll experience satisfaction, we'll experience fulfillment, we'll experience peace. We will know his presence and power day after day. And we'll experience this because God is with us. Because of what he has achieved for us in the cross, we can have life and life in all its fullness. But as we do that, we will also suffer. We'll be called to take up our cross and we'll experience this call to take up our cross because this is a picture of Christ. He loved and knew his heavenly father, yet he suffered greatly and we will love and know God in our lives and yet at the same time, paradoxically, we will suffer greatly. The two go hand in hand. This is what it means to be a follower of Christ. It's so embedded in the reality of Christ and the gospel. And all of this is connected to why it is that James says what he says in our passage today in verses two to four. And when, when you read our passage again, you will discover that James actually views trials and hardship as something positive. A positive in a sense that they can be used for God's bigger plan and purpose. So let's just take stock of what James says. And I'm going to just read verses 2 to 4 again from James chapter 1. James says, Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. So this morning we're thinking about what it means to have a suffering faith, a suffering faith. And this morning, what I want to do is ask a very simple question from this passage. The question is this, it'll be up on the screen. How can our suffering shape us into the people that God has created us to be? How can our suffering shape us into the people that God has created us to be? And note this morning, I say can. How can our suffering? Because there's no guarantee that the suffering you go through will shape you correctly. It's really up to you. You need to respond to the suffering in the right way. You need to turn to God and not turn to yourself or turn to something else. God requires of each one of us a dependent heart, not an independent heart. So James wants us to see the peculiar purpose of God in the moment or the moments of pain and suffering that we have, that we so often have. And he begins this letter with these words in verse two. Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, and the first thing to take note of here is James says, my brothers and sisters. And we can be certain that James is speaking to the early believers here. He's speaking to the church. And this applies to us. For those of us who have faith in Jesus today, we can be certain that James is speaking directly to us in our situation, in our context, 
in our confusions and difficulties. And the second thing to highlight from this verse is that this word for trials can have two meanings. Trials is a Greek word, and bear with me here, perasmos, perasmos. And this word can mean two things. It can mean an outward test or an inward temptation. An outward test or an inward temptation. Two definitions that helpfully summarize what it is we go through when we suffer. It can either be an outward test or an inward temptation. Our suffering is either external or internal, let's be honest. And as we take hold of that definition from the wider context of what James writes here, it becomes clear that he's speaking of a trial in the sense of an outward test. This is what he's focusing on in James chapter 1. Something that's been inflicted upon us. And I say that because this definition of trials as being external fits within the wider context of the book of James with the rest of his letter. He mentions trial in verse 2, and we see how this is connected elsewhere throughout the book. So James says these words here, recognizing that the people of God that he's seeking to minister and encourage are experiencing this outward, this external trial, this external test. So what was it that these early believers, most likely followers, who were young in the faith, what was it that these guys were going through? Uh, Douglas Moon, his commentary, identifies a number of sources of our suffering from what he reads in the rest of James. So he recognizes that these believers were most likely experiencing poverty. This is something we see in James. Most likely, they were experiencing persecution. Most likely, they were being harassed and rejected by the wealthy because they were deciding to follow Christ and to live a simple life. And they were most likely coming to terms with the fact that, that they were exiles, they were refugees. They'd been displaced and they were now living in a foreign land because of their faith. James knows that it's not just one trial that they have. It's not like he's writing to this large group and they all have a singular problem. James knows that these, these problems they have are many. And so he addresses this general issue, this bigger issue of issues of problems that we have and how it is we should biblically respond to these. And it's the same for us, let's be honest. You know, this morning, if I was to ask all of us individually, what is it that you've been through in the last year that you would describe as a trial? What have you been through in the last year that you would describe as a trial? Would it not be the case that every single one of us would have some different kind of problem or a variation of the same problem? We all have different hardships. We all have different circumstances. And we all suffer to greater or lesser degrees. None of us have been through the exact same experience. As James writes to these varied people who have a varied experience of trials, he's also speaking to us as we come to terms with our varied difficulties and hardships. William Bartley speaks about this in his commentary in James. And he basically illuminates just what it is that, that James is trying to highlight here when he says various trials. So Bartley says this, speaking of all kinds of experiences will come to us, there will be test of the sorrows and the disappointments which seek to take our faith away. There will be the test of the seductions which seek to lure us from the right way. There will be the tests of the dangers, the sacrifices and the unpopularity which are so much a part of the Christian way. So I wonder if, if you found it difficult in your life to stand for Jesus. You've experienced mocking or rejection or some kind of hardship because you've made your stand for Christ. Understand that, that James gets this. This is who James is speaking to. And James has a particular word for this problem and so many other problems. So our trials are legion. And the reality is that this is what it means to live in a world of sin and brokenness and suffering. It's not like we become Christians and all our problems disappear. In fact, the opposite, our problems start to crank up a bit. We experience more difficulty. But the difference is, the difference is we have Jesus. And that makes all the difference. That makes it all worth it. We're not just suffering for the sake of suffering. We're suffering for his name. We count it worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. Hallelujah. So how do we respond to this? Well, James calls us to consider he says, consider them in a certain way. Consider these trials that you have in a particular way. And that word consider 
is a verb in the Greek, and it's essentially a command for us to think correctly about what it is we go through. Think correctly about what it is you face in your life. This word consider could also be translated from the Greek, take thought of, reckon, in your thinking, identify what it is you're going through and understand what it is you're going through in light of this bigger gospel picture. We could read this verse in this way. Think about the trial that you're going through as great joy. Think about what you face in your life as great joy. I wonder if that's easy for you. I know the answer, it's not easy for us. But it is when we trust and depend upon God and rely upon his power. Apart from this verse, has anyone ever said to you, the words of James chapter 1 and verse 2. Can you imagine for a moment you're going through this very difficult season. You're overwhelmed by what it is you face. You share with someone close to you and their immediate response is this. Think about what you're going through as joy. Now, I know I would probably push back on that advice. Um, there might be reason for that because they might say it in a flippant way. Just like, be joyful. The reality is that this person is being deeply biblical and deeply practical. This is the correct way to respond to our particular trials. But let's not avoid the elephant in the room this morning. We're all thinking this. The very first thing that comes to our minds, our initial thought to what it is we're facing, is very rarely, in fact, you might even say never, ever one of joy. We never respond initially to what we face with joy. Hopefully we get to that place where we consider it as joy, but our initial response is not that. We so often try and fix our trial, or we shut ourselves down, or we blame our other people, or we push ourselves into busyness, or we lose sight of reality, or we respond in a whole host of different sinful and, and broken ways. And James says, don't do any of that. Don't do any of that. Instead, respond with joy. And he says, respond with joy first and foremost with your mind. Respond with joy with your mind. Think about what you're going through as joy. And it has to begin with your thoughts. This is an invitation to bring God into the situation that you face. We're saying, God, I want to know you deeper through this impossible moment that I'm facing. And we see that even more by the fact it's not just any kind of joy that he wants us to respond with through our trial. James says, consider, think about what you're going through, not as a joy, but as a great joy. A great joy. Now, this is not James saying that we should consider the particular trial in and of itself as a joy. We don't look at the, the problem we face as joy. We look at our problem and we do not celebrate and rejoice at a problem. That disconnects us from the reality of what we face. And it might even be a bad witness to those who don't know Christ. James is also not saying that we should feel joyful or happy in the midst of a trial. This is not James saying when you go through what you go through, make sure you smile. He's not saying that. I think James would want to have serious conversation with a person who wrote a song that contains these lyrics. I'm in right, out right, up right, down right, happy all the time. I said that in a really serious tone. But that song is completely unbiblical because we're not happy all the time. We don't experience the emotion of happiness in every moment of our lives. That's not joy. That's not normal human behavior. When James speaks about this great joy, he's talking about something much deeper. He's asking us to carry within us a wholehearted joy that's completely rooted in God. God through his spirit is the source of that joy. And God, through his spirit, is the object of that joy. So God enables us to have joy. And as we fix our eyes upon God in the midst of what we face, we experience more and more joy. He's both before and after the trial. And it's all fueled by the spirit. And it all results in joy. Uh, Blomberg and Mariam in a commentary on James provide this helpful definition. And I believe this really touches on what it is that James is getting at here when he speaks of joy. So they say this, joy may be defined as a settled contentment in every situation or an unnatural reaction of deep, steady and unadulterated thankful trust in God. I could read that all day. I think that's just a really helpful quote for us. A settled contentment in every situation. To know that no matter what you face, God is with you and God is going to help you. 
an unnatural reaction of deep, steady, and unadulterated, thankful trust in God. You know, I, I think of moments in my life at times, but I also think of many believers who have been through the mill and they've had this, this unnatural reaction of peace and contentment in the midst of what we faced. That's not from that person. That's a supernatural work of God within their life. The point I'm trying to make this morning is joy without God isn't joy. It's mere earthly happiness or enthusiasm. And it's never going to work when it comes to the trial that you face. Joy is when everything you look around, everything around you is screaming, screaming at you to look out, to look horizontally. But instead, you consciously choose to look up. Joy is when with every fiber of your being you declare, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. This is what it means to consider a great joy when you go through that trial, when you face that test, when you experience that suffering. So it's joy because we have God in the midst of our suffering and it's joy because us responding in this particular way is going to change us for the better. And this is what James begins to touch upon in verse 3 of our passage. So have a look at, at verse 3. So he says, Consider your trial as a great joy, and then verse 3, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. The testing of your faith produces endurance. Such an important quality for you and I to have, the ability to endure. Like any quality, like any fruit of the Spirit, like any blessing that God might give to us in our lives, we will very rarely experience this virtue or these virtues unless our lives have been opened up to such a degree that these qualities are being developed within us. It's not like we just get zapped with these qualities of endurance and of our virtues. We have to experience something that results in these qualities and virtues being developed. It's, and we only ever endure when it's tough when life is difficult, and when we find it difficult to see any way forward. And this is not just James, this is something we find throughout our Bibles. The New Testament is full of examples of the importance of endurance and the recognition that we experience endurance when we have the opportunity to endure, and we have the opportunity to endure when life is really tough. So have a look at what Paul writes in Romans chapter 5 and verses 1 to 5, and there's, there's such strong similarities between what James writes and the Apostle Paul says here, Paul says in verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace, in which we stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And verse 3 is key for us. And not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions, because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character. And proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So Paul could not be clearer. Like James says, our afflictions, the seasons of suffering in our lives, produce within us endurance. This endurance leads to proven character. It leads to hope. It leads to a deeper experience of God's love within our hearts. So we see, I hope we see the connection between James and Paul. And not just James and the Apostle Paul. Have a look at what the Apostle Peter says. So 1 Peter 1 and verses 5 to 7, Peter says this. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials. So that the proven character of your faith more valuable than gold, which will perishable as refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Peter wants us to see that all of our suffering is in fact preparation for future moments in our earthly life. Our present day suffering is also preparation for all that God has planned when he will return. So it makes total sense that we would experience a great joy when we go through great trials because God through his spirit is doing a great work in our lives and he has drawn us nearer to him and we experience his goodness present day but we also experience the hope that we have 
of eternity. God is preparing us for heaven. Amen. Something we often forget through our trials is the opportunity it gives to help others, to be a blessing to others. Our suffering actually enables us to help others who go through similar experiences. And through that, the church and the mission is strengthened. God is glorified and we can't help but experience joy in our lives as we see how it is that God uses us through our trial. So Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1 and verses 4 to 5, he comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Verse 5, for just as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. And some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you have went through a difficult time and God has used you in a future moment to then be a blessing to somebody else. Let me just say that was part of God's plan. He designed it that way so that you could strengthen and equip that person, having already experienced that yourself, bringing greater unity to the church and allowing God to be glorified in the midst of your fellowship. James continues speaking about the impact of this endurance in verse 4. We read these words. Let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. And there's no question about it. I think all of us would want to be mature. All of us would want to be complete. All of us would want to say that we lack nothing. What it is that we struggle with is going down the necessary path to obtaining that within our lives. James wants us to understand this morning that the source of his gifts is endurance. And this endurance is a result of the particular trials of our lives. So the goal for you and I, no matter what it is that life might throw at us, is to be a people who are constantly faithful and fruitful for him. Our life circumstances may go up and down. We may experience blessing or hardship. But God wants us to fix our eyes on him. This leads to endurance and this leads to great fruit. So as we finish up, my prayer for you this morning is that your testimony would be the words of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 17 and verses 7 to 8. He says this. Let's just take a moment to reflect on these words. The person who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence indeed is the Lord, is blessed. He will be like a tree planted by water. It sends its roots out toward a stream. It doesn't fear when heat comes and its foliage remains green. It will not worry in a year of drought or cease producing fruit. I'm really challenged by that. Can I honestly say Mark trusts in the Lord? Can I honestly say Mark's confidence indeed is the Lord and he is blessed? Mark will be like a tree planted by the water that sends its roots out toward the stream. Mark does not fear when the heat comes. Mark will not worry in a year of drought. Mark will not cease producing fruit no matter what it is that life might throw at him. I'm really challenged by that. I hope you're challenged by that as well as you put your name in that passage. Can you put your name amongst the words of Jeremiah? Do you want to put your name amongst these words? This is not a command to dry harder and be more committed. Notice how Jeremiah begins, the person who trusts in the Lord. It's not a person who, who tries really hard in the Lord. It's a person who trusts in the Lord. That, that person is the one who will be abundantly fruitful in the midst of a trial. And I love what William Bartley says in his commentary. In the second part of this quote, he thinks about the greater purpose behind our suffering and our trials. So he says this, um, but they, speaking of our trials, they are not meant to make us fall. They are meant to make us soar. We looked at that already this morning with Isaiah 40. They are not meant to defeat us. They are meant to be defeated. They are not, our trials are not meant to make us weaker. They are meant to make us stronger. Therefore, we should not complain about them. We should rejoice in them. Christians are like athletes. The heavier the course of training they undergo, the more they are glad because they know that it is preparing them all the better for victorious effort. So would you not like this kind of response in your own life? One that sees beyond the visible, and towards the invisible. One that rejoices, because God is not just changing you for the better here and now, he's also preparing you for heaven. Consider it a great joy, 
my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Amen. So this morning, we want to create space uh, for you to respond to all that we've spoken about. Um, I'm aware of the fact that quite possible you've never made a decision for Jesus to be Lord of your life. You've never said, I'm going to make Jesus the very center of who I am. And in all that I'm facing, well, there's opportunity for you to do that today. If you've never consciously decided to follow him, then do speak to myself or speak to someone you know and trust. And we would count it a privilege to pray for you. Uh, perhaps this morning you're going through a trial right now. So we recognize that we do walk in on a Sunday carrying various difficulties and various hardships. And you would like prayer for that. Again, First, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. As we have suffered, we want to help those who are suffering. So again, speak to myself or speak to someone you know. This morning we also invite you to receive prayer for healing. We worship the God who can and does heal. So if you have an illness, a sickness, a pain, then do speak to myself, TG or Paul. We would count it, as elders of the church, we would count it a privilege to pray and trust that God has his very best for you in the midst of what you face. As we respond and worship, we also come to this table. And as we look at this table, you can't help but recognize that suffering is embedded in the person of Jesus Christ. As we think about the gospel, we see that suffering is at the very heart of what Jesus did for us. And for that reason, we should not be surprised when we go through what we go through because we know that our Lord Jesus Christ went through it before us and he understands what it is we face. So come to this table. If you love the Lord, we invite any of you or all of you to come to this table to respond and worship and to recognize that Jesus has done it all for us we have this glorious hope. As we suffer, we also look ahead and we look forward to the glorious hope we have in Christ. It was on the night in which he was betrayed that Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. And the same way he took the cup and he said, this, covenant is, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. So I invite you to take this bread, to drink this cup and to recognize that our suffering has a purpose. And his ultimate purpose has been fulfilled for us on the cross. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you that, that you are a good God. You are a faithful God. You never leave us nor forsake us. And we can come to you in this time in full recognition that you want to bless us today. We don't need to step outside of your will and try and work things out ourselves. You want to help us and you want to equip us. And you want to lead us into greater and deeper paths of righteousness. So Lord, I pray that you would convict of sin, that you would heal, that you would comfort, that you would strengthen, and that we would walk away from this time today, completely changed and transformed because we have a bigger view of you and we have a greater understanding of who it is you call us to be. Help us, Lord, to suffer well in the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. Stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me. I 
joy in our hearts with our eyes fixed firmly on you knowing that in our sufferings and trials we can look to you that we would suffer in your name Amen <laughs> 